everyone. Uh, my name is Eugene Yang. I'm a cardiologist and professor of medicine at the University of Washington. And I'm here joined by Dr. Alta Skuta. Uh, we just finished a phenomenal session on uh, cuffless blood pressure devices. Are they ready for prime time? Uh, and Dr. Skuta gave a really excellent overview of where we are with that. Uh, so Dr. Skuta, can you tell us a little bit about what your presentation was focused on? Uh, thank you, Eugene. Um, yes, it, I think it's uh, quite an interesting time to be discussing cuffless monitoring. It's a very uh, fast developing space, new technologies emerging, and I think many clinicians are not sure you know, what to do with the data that's uh, coming forward from patients using these devices. They're around everywhere. There are hundreds available now. Uh, and so the question is, what do we do with them? Um, are they acceptable to use? Um, so we have been thinking about that quite a bit. I'm also involved with the European Society of Hypertension and we've been publishing quite a few papers on the topic uh, on whether we should be using these devices or not. And in the end, the bottom line is really that it's not ready for prime time yet. Uh, the moral of the story, we can't, can't recommend them for using clinical practice. And that is because we have to test basically two things when it comes to cuffless devices and that's whether they are clinically useful but firstly, whether they are accurate. Yeah, I think as you have owned, uh, published yourself, you know, looking at the number of devices that are available, we have patients coming in with the devices, with the readings. So how would we talk to them about this? Like, what do we tell them when they come in with these readings, say everything looks good? Yeah, that is, that is the, 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 the trick question. I think even when patients come with home blood pressure, traditional cuff-based home blood pressure, doctors don't often know what to do with that data. Um, I think we, we should use this as an as a opportunity to also educate patients and educate our colleagues to say, okay, these devices are available. I think it's actually, in, in some sense, a fantastic screening tool for the general population. Mm -hmm. Now, people really want to interact with technology. So it's a way to detect half of the population with hypertension who's not aware of their high blood pressure status. So it is an opportunity there. But when a patient with hypertension uses that as a monitor for their own blood pressure at home, it can be risky because we've seen very big discrepancies in terms of the accuracy of these devices. So. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, you know, as a clinician I don't think we should recommend it at all, but when they come with the measurements, I think it would be good to recommend also cuff-based home blood pressure or ambulatory blood pressure and tell them, let's compare these values and, and see what, what we find. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have both the Stride BP that the Europeans use for validated devices in the United States, we have the VDL or validated device listing, so I think you're right, it might be a great way to uh, introduced to patients to saying it might be a problem and then to redirecting them to use one of the validated devices until some of the technology gets better. So let me ask you, are you optimistic? Do you think there's a future? Are we going to get to a point where the devices can be validated? I'm extremely optimistic, but I'm an optimist in nature. <laughs> uh, I think, I think um, you know, Things are developing so rapidly in terms of tech. We see what's going on with artificial intelligence, how it's already changed our worlds in one year. So I have, um, I have very positive feelings in terms of the future of cuffless devices, but we have to give it time to develop. We have to catch up as from the cl clinical side, we have to catch up and see how will it be useful, how can we implement it, and how can it be acceptable, both to patients and GPs, to uh, actually use it in clinical practice. So I'm optimistic, absolutely. I think coming from an environment where there's a lot of technology uh, in Seattle and in the Bay Area, I think Dr. Shimbo's point was really good where he brought up that we've already unleashed the horse. You have chat GPT that's already being used for potential clinical applications. And so, uh, you know, maybe we're trying to sort of reposition things and re sort of direct things in a way where we do find opportunities to make it useful, but we, we're still sort of trying to figure that all out. But Dr. Skuta, can we talk a little bit more about, you know, what kind of validation protocols do you think we should be using? Is that the way, is that the next step to move this uh, field forward? You know, many of these device companies have used the validation protocols that's developed for cuffs, cuff devices, and it's not the uh, correct approach. There's been several studies showing they will almost always pass the validation criteria. We've already seen many papers out there showing, yes, these devices are accurate, but 
it's inappropriate to use that. So um, various organizations, the ISO, the IEEE engineering standards, and now also the European Society of Hypertension have released validation protocol for specifically cuffless devices. So it's quite a lot of hoops for these companies and for these devices to get through in order to be establishing whether they can track changes in blood pressure effectively. That's what's making these device technology very different. They have to be able to track changes during sleep, during activity, or when taking medication. And uh, so that's, I think, uh, the next step. So once they've passed these, I think we will feel much more comfortable in recommending these devices for our patients. I agree. I think clinicians are going to be nervous that if we don't have the validation protocols, they may not trust the data that they're getting. And so unless we do that very important next step, then I think, you know, how this really is going to be used in clinical practice, you know, is really going to be difficult. So. Uh, Dr. Skuta, I want to thank you for uh, being with us today and for your excellent presentation. Thank you, Eugene.